right, as the hush dies down here, we're gonna get ready to introduce our uh, next two speakers. It is going to be a uh, joint presentation uh, by these two fine individuals from opposite sides of, of the, the Interstate 40 corridor, so to speak, <laughs> the way I see it. Uh, so we've got uh, Mr. Eric Hope, who's uh, joining us from Nashville, and Kate Kavatsa. Uh, from Charlotte. Uh, Eric, I'm going to read these directly. I apologize. I wish these are really um, incredible write ups. I wish I knew them inside and out, but I don't, and I don't want to uh, do, not do you justice. So, uh, Eric holds a bachelor's degree in interior architecture from Ohio University and joined the Civic Design Center team in 2012. He was a board member of Transit Now Nashville and served as vice president. He was part of WeGo, Public Transit's Better Bus Committee, is an alum of the Urban Land Institute's Health Leaders Network, was on Smart Growth America's Complete Streets Leadership Academy Committee, and has represented the Civic Design Center on the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Committee and Connect Middle Tennessee Transit Coalition, where he continues his passion for sustainability, transportation, advocacy, and design. And I can tell you last night after our conversation, he is truly passionate about all of those. So um, as director of the design studio, Eric has been involved in most of the last decade of projects at the Civic Design Center in various capacities. Some of his favorites include prioritizing pedestrian safety on Dickerson, envisioning a new park in Madison, and working on the new East Bank neighborhood. Mr. Eric Hope. Next to him on his right, coxing, rowing the boat, uh, is Kate Cavazza, uh, an associate urban designer and planner at the City of Charlotte Urban Design Center. She manages the Placemaking Grant Program, a community building initiative that supports quick wins and transformative projects throughout the city to create and enhance community vibrancy, safety, and identity. She has a master's in political science from Lehigh University and a bachelor's in political science and French language studies from Susquehanna University. She is passionate about connecting community members to planning, urban design, and policy resources to make positive changes in the built environment. She spends every minute, and I don't think I'm over exaggerating here, every minute, not in the office, on the water, rowing, rafting, or training for a regatta. So, Miss Kate Cavazza. <laughs> Who's getting this? Yeah, that's you, okay. Uh -huh. Hey everyone, this is awesome. It's so exciting to be here with everyone and uh, to get talk about, I think both of our, at least some of our favorite subjects. So, uh, we, we thought since we both work for design centers that we sort of combined our presentations here and then talk about some of the similarities and differences between a uh, nonprofit uh, form design center and a government informed one. So yeah. Oh wonderful. Well hey everybody. My name is Kate Gavaza. Um, I'm an associate urban designer and planner at the City of Charlotte's Urban Design Center. Um, just a little bit about the Urban Design Center before we start. Um, we were launched in 2016. We're the newest division um, of the planning department. Um, we are a multidisciplinary staff of seven people. We got landscape architects, architects, planners, designers, one public policy person. Um, and we work together to advance the quality of Charlotte's built environment um, and increase the awareness of public um, design. And we do that, our buckets fall into three categories, right? We work on consultancy, um, where our staff works with um, interdepartmental partners. We work with our long range planning team, our area transit, um, and we're subject matter experts for the city in terms of fabric design. Um, we also do studio programming where we open our studio space. So we have this amazing building. We've been like excommunicated from the government center uptown. We're in the heart of South End on our light rail station. We open this amazing space up for um, community education, um, as well as being a hub for the design community in Charlotte. And then our third bucket is placemaking. Um, placemaking to us is smaller processes where we work with community members to put these quick wins into um, execution. Um, and that's where I come in and I'm really excited to share about our smaller scale projects and how we can put this into um, 
put projects on the street from a placemaking perspective and through the other municipalities. That's me. Uh, yeah, so if you're on the gram, follow me, Eric Koch, Design Director at the Civic Design Center. Um, Ooh, yeah, sorry. I have a few. Um, so the Civic Design Center's mission is to advocate for civic design visions and actionable change in communities to improve the quality of life for all. Uh, and so we do that through, these are our guiding principles for civic design, and so these are, the, the type of work we do really spans the gambit. I mean, there, we, you know, everything from public space uh, to streets to transportation to advocacy, uh, environments, housing, we, we sort of touch it in all aspects of our work. So uh, that's why I, I love this uh, group of folks, because I think like the beautification efforts lead to a lot of the planning efforts that we try to tackle. So excited to talk to you about some of our work and hopefully you can uh, be inspired and, and maybe we can collaborate on something. So, um, and I guess I'll say we, we set up our project and sort of these, or our presentation and sort of these three sections. So uh, the first section is addressing interstate barriers, which I think Jack discussed very well and set, up, set us up nicely for the, um, our talk. And then reclaiming public space is sort of the second phase and then uh, community collaboration. So that's what we're in for. Thank you. So to set it up, Charlotte is a city of just 900,000 people. <laughs> and we have about 2 million people in our county. Um, we are the 15th largest city in the US and we're the fifth fastest growing city. By 2030, we're supposed to get another million people. Um, but our story is not unique. We are, we also suffer from um, urban renewal projects. We are 50th out of 50 largest metros in terms of economic mobility. I should have put a map of uh, Charlotte up here to give you a larger context, but we have concentric um, interstate problems. Um, our um, city is both racially and economic, economically segregated, um, and we f refer to this segmentation as the crescent and the wedge. The north section of Charlotte is the wedge with everybody, and then the wedge is the bottom south section of affluence. Um, and our work is um, geographically spread across the entire city, and the urban arboretum trail is a reflection of um, a project that reconnects historically uh, African-American neighborhoods that have been segregated by the Federal Highway Act um, with the goal of preserving tree canopy. Um, this is a project that's been going on for about five years. Um, it's a partnership between the Urban Design Center, the Tree Canopy Preservation, and our urban forestry folks um, in placemaking. Um, some of the elements along this trail are um, reconnections under interstates. Um, it's more of a quick win, right? So we're working with community members um, to identify these small scale connections over a five mile loop. So the loop goes from our, ooh, ooh, our uptown section um, in that bottom corner up to our only tier one arboretum in the Pinewood Elmwood Cemetery. Um, it's a stitching together um, on a much large, smaller scale than the stitch. I'd like to use the word lace. Like we are <laughs> using existing infrastructure um, to connect these neighborhoods um, and putting together um, connectors. Uh, we were lucky enough to work with CDOT and finally, finally get some signage together um, to mark uh, our bicycle route. Um, the Urban Arboretum Trail is also about gathering spaces. When we talk about infrastructure and our aging community as well, our Greenville neighborhood in the top corner is predominantly older folk who have been in their homes for years. So we are focusing on gathering spaces and making this walkable, accessible, and putting some parking around um, these spaces to put the focus on community space, gathering and um, tree canopy preservation. Um, our next project that I'd like to talk about, it's a little bit uh, removed from the Urban Arboretum Trail, but this is our I-77 Trade Street underpass mural. Um, this is the largest mural in the city. It's 133 feet long and it has a mirror on the other side. 
Um, we worked with a uh, local artist and it tells the story of displacement in the city. Um, but in terms of the bu bureaucratic side of this, this mural represents um, an opportunity where we worked with NCDOT, the Public uh, Art Commission. Um, the Public Art Commission at NCDOT has to review every single public art uh, installation in the right of way for any city project. Um, before this mural, um, every project had to go through city council. Um, and in 2019, we got sick of doing that. And our planning director um, was able to work when we put a joint resolution together um, to make it. So when a public art project is coming through the pipeline, it we don't have to wait to get city council approval. There's a blanket approval with any public art um, and that saves time. It reduces barriers to getting these things on the ground um, because the NCDOT process takes six months of review anyway. We don't wanna make communities wait in this interim process for putting something beautiful in the right of way. Um, and we're really proud of um, that change. It might not be a giant sparkling you know piece of legislation but it makes it easier for our communities to approach um, art in in disused spaces I'll pass it off yeah um yeah i love the sort of processes that lead to the simplification of those things i think that that helps to implement projects so uh to continue on our interstate barriers um journey I can, I'll find there we go. Oh. Um, oh, sorry. Give it away. Uh, so, rewind back to Nashville in 1995. Uh, this was a cover of the scene, if you're familiar, to local uh, or magazine there uh, from one of the founders of our organization prior to our organization existing. So, uh, it was the sentiment of this was around a proposal from TDOT to build an interstate style. A uh, piece of infrastructure literally right through the center of downtown Nashville. And so uh, this was actually a map from TDOT that was presented to the community that uh, if you're familiar with Nashville at all, uh, Korean Veterans Boulevard is, is where this was proposed. So it really would have separated what is now the Sobro area of downtown completely from existing downtown area. So there was a group that met regularly called the Urban Design Forum. These were just civic advocates, uh, planners, architects, people involved in, in discussions on a monthly basis. And we actually continue this program to this day, but they presented an alternative vision. They called it the Franklin Street Corridor, but it was um, akin to what we see on Korean Veterans Boulevard. It was like a human scale, pedestrian oriented, walkable street where you, know, you could pretty easily cross at any block where you felt it was appropriate. And so they were actually successful in presenting uh, TDOT this alternative vision and, and lobbying and getting community support to build the street as a uh, more um, livable street, I guess I would say. Um, and so from that moment, they felt that we needed a, a government or a, a entity to do this um, consistently. So they formed the Civic Design Center around this publication, which is called The Plan in Nashville. Um, the Plan in Nashville is based on the Plan of Chicago, but it basically presents a 40-year vision for the city. And so this was in the early uh, 2000s that this was published and uh, still informs and, and out of that yielded the guiding principles, which I showed earlier, uh, but it still guides the work and, and a lot of what we do today. So a big part of the plan in Nashville was this. Um, this is the East Bank, if you're familiar with Nashville, it's right across the river, the Cumberland River from downtown. Largely industrial, historic uh, shipbuilding area, um, but currently houses the uh, Tennessee Titans Stadium and a lot of parking. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 this, the Tennessee Titans were um, new to the area in uh, 1999, the stadium was complete. And so that it happened right around the time that the Planet Nashville was happening. So this was a big focus of the Planet Nashville is how do we <coughs> utilize this huge, literally 300 acres, basically in downtown Nashville and, and reinvent it for communities. And so this was a vision from the plan that was created. And I think it was pretty forward thinking because a lot of the ideas talked about uh, what we call the urban boulevard. And it's this uh, this sort of, uh, you know, Arc de Triomphe looking uh, 
bridge and, and big civic circle uh, were, were what they thought the people who were involved in that process at the time thought the interstate should look like in the future. Um, so I say that to, and a, a lot of excitement and energy. This was an article from the Tennessean that <laughs> talked about the radical uh, suggestion that it was. So then fast forward to this year, this was a rendering that was put out actually just a few weeks ago uh, by Perkins Eastman, who is the, the developer basically working on the site plan for this. So it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we heard uh, about the stitch and, and sort of the legacy of the, the project, like it, it takes time and we still haven't seen a ton of movement, but we're, we're implementing plans and they've issued uh, master developers for large sections of this area. A lot of the uh, consolidation of the interstate ramps, you know, it's, it's sort of the baby steps, you know, the, the simple quick wins, but, you know, simple um, things like that. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention too around interstate barriers is this is an area of um, North Nashville, so just do north of downtown, but this is actually a great resource and there's, uh, it's from the Tennessee State Archives and there's, a, there's actually a big section in here about East Knoxville too, so if you're interested in this, it's really cool, it's like an interactive uh, storytelling online feature and if you're not if you've never looked at it before you can see like historic street grids you know the way they were built and then overlay it with the contemporary street grid which you see here so uh, Jefferson <coughs> Street is a very important street for uh, Nashville and Music City and really the country like Jimi Hendrix got his start on Jefferson Street lots of great uh, music history comes from Jefferson <coughs> Street but in the mid-century this road was basically bifurcated by the interstate uh, into, you know, it creates, you can see it's sort of the three sections, which also is home to our uh, HBCUs and, and many other important cultural institutions. So a lot of devastation happened from this. And so I, I included this just so you can see, like these were the historic uh, clubs that housed a lot of the sort of origins of American music. And it, it happened right here on Jefferson Street uh, I, I can't even tell you like the, the names that come off of these clubs, um, but a lot of great ones. And so, but you can see like where they're positioned on this little map on the side They're you know, it completely destroyed. These buildings don't exist anymore. They've been uh, fell out of disrepair and demolished and removed. There's one of them is left standing today. And there's been efforts to sort of revitalize and reconnect, um, and, and they're valiant and, and good. Uh, these, this is a project called Gateway to Heritage, where um, probably not as heavy of an investment as Walk uh, Birmingham, but you know there was sort of the, the thoughts and, and ideas behind that uh, with installing art, uh, like reminiscing of history and historic moments, but still hasn't really um, seen the investment that it needs. Um, then fast forward again, another publication in 2016, this is called Shaping Healthy Community, the Nashville Plan, but it's uh, basically a diagnosis of different community types and uh, suggests health interventions across Nashville, but could be applied pretty much anywhere. And so enter more of these capping conversations in North, North Nashville. And I included these just to show you that we've been thinking a lot about <laughs> highway capping, but not a ton of movement until uh, 2020, then we introduced a new transportation plan and uh, put this little price tag on it, $175 million for This is uh, a reconnecting Jefferson Street project, basically. And so uh, this came from the Congress for New Urbanism, did a uh, charrette process with our community. And then uh, it was sort of re-released to the public recently and had basically no community engagement or, or uh, thought. So there was a lot of resistance to the project. And so it kind of stalled out, but that's where, uh, this is a sort of a clip I took from one of our projects that shows and tries to address some of the needs that we heard in one of those community meetings and, and say, let's not just scrap it. Let's try to um, introduce some of the needs that the community said. So all that to say, we haven't actually made a ton of progress on highway capping, but I think Hopefully that, you know, just having the visions and the visuals can help inspire change and then maybe set us up to apply for some of that federal money. So, um, yeah, I guess. Okay, fine. Yeah. Well, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Hey. So we, we, these are planted uh, discussion moments. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk beforehand. <laughs> no. So as we think about um, the, the longevity of these projects, you know, how do you keep public interest in your projects as we move forward? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge question. And, and just the more engagement that, I mean, it's hard. Engagement takes time, energy, money, like all those things. And uh, you just have to, I think that's sort of the benefit of an organization like ours is that we can put that into sort of beating the drum around these ideas and the importance of, of reconnecting and restitching, relacing hey. communities. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but you got to just keep uh, championing ideas and keep having these types of discussions where you can, um, you know, think big about connection to East Knoxville or, or things like that. But, yeah. yeah. And as a, like, as a government person and you're sitting in the municipal square, it is so important to have that advocacy connection and to have the partnership to have a fork in your side to be able to be like, these are the relevant projects. This is what we need. And as staff to embrace that conflict and be like, yes, let's talk. And that, I feel like that always spurs conversation um, in the community sphere and it helps on the public side as well. Does, uh, so can I ask you a question? I would be delighted, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm curious about, so a lot of the engagement process, you know, we, we search for artists and things like that in our communities. and. I uh, love those, those the projects you've shown us and love to hear about sort of the selection process for the arts that sort of that went on to inform the designs for the project. Yeah, thank you. Um, it teased me up for a section later on. Um, but one of the cool things about public art in the public sphere is it's so visible and to have um, with our grant selection process in particular, it is a it starts with an interdepartmental staff um, selection committee. So this is pulled together from CDOT, um, our housing and neighborhood services people are on the panel, other government staff grantees, but we also have practitioners. So we have muralists who have completed other city projects before. They sit in and weigh on on the feasibility of this project. Like if we cannot put, we cannot put a mural, you know, on the side of a skyscraper, random things that come up all the time. Like what kind of paint do we use um, in offering that technical assistance? Um, but it's also taking our selection and taking it back to the public. Um, the Urban Arboretum Trail is a great example of um, that's a project that's been going on for five years. Um, the selection of the neighborhood artists have come directly from the people who have worked there. And we only know that because we have been on the ground ourselves. So working with our apartment complex um, on the route, they were pulled into that review committee, but it's being open and accepting all the perspectives that come in um, in making it transparent. Um, the more you can put it on public input, the better. I think that speaks to a lot of our discussion about just the more robust engagement you can do. I think mm. just the more powerful and emphasis your project will have. So. Nice. And that brings us to the placemaking program. This is my pride and joy. Um, there are five main components <coughs> to our placemaking program. Um, it's our grant work, it's our creative pool, which I will talk about with our artist selection, um, larger capital projects and our placemaking hub. This is an image that was awarded to our farmer's market this year. Um, we have our City of Charlotte Uptown Cycle Track this is a uh, major project that's been underway for five years to reconnect Uptown to our neighbors. Um, and the Uptown Farmer's Market is in the parking lot behind and they applied uh, for a grant to beautify the, uh, this is not the bike lane, this is the space between the buffered bike lane and the road um, with wayfinding for fruits and vegetables. This is about a $5,000 project um, with a local artist um, our placemaking grant program uh, was founded in 2019, so we just closed our fourth cycle of grant funding. Um, we used about $200,000 of our budget this year to find 12 new community placemaking projects. Um, these projects create an enhanced vibrancy um, by activating those leftover spaces, uh, the underutilized spaces, the streetscapes that you're like, oof, that needs some work. Um, and installing the public art in these beautification efforts. Um, and our grant program is low barrier to apply. 
anybody can apply. Individuals, nonprofits, up to our business improvement district applies for grants. Um, and these are some of the funding opportunities that we have done. We've done bus stop improvements, community gardens, um, the signal cabinet wraps, and it's also the technical assistance that comes with it. We don't expect our community members to know how to navigate the complexities of putting in a swing, for example. Um, and we help uh, facilitate that um, process. Um, these are some of our favorites throughout the years. Um, Lavanya Parks did a mural on a Rita's Ice sculpture. Um, we did a bus stop, Hashim Halim, with our Derida neighborhood. That man collected <coughs> 2,000 plastic bags and molded them into a bench. Um, and I think that speaks to like Charlotte's right vibrancy and willingness of our creative community to step in with out of the box um, and the city to fund it. Our third image there is Georgie Nakima. She finished that uh, two months ago and that's on the side of Charlotte's newest um, affordable housing complex, Sugary Place by Dream Key Partners. Um, in, in terms of cost, they applied for a $25,000 grant. Hashim had a $5,000 grant for his um, uh, bus stop. And um, the next one was the Lion Services. Uh, they help people who are visually impaired find jobs. And we wanted a tactile um, project on the side of their building. And we have on historic West End Charlotte, uh, Charles J. Jones, uh, civil rights activist from Charlotte and done by Abel Jackson. And so when community members apply for these grants, um, it's also not a given that you know an artist to go paint a beautiful mural on the side of a building. So in addition to our placemaking grant, we run a creative pool. And this is an administrative fast pass for um, Charlotte creatives to apply to the city. Um, we set them up in the vendor system. Um, in 2020, we realized as a staff of six that we can't you know, weld stuff for people. I can't go paint a bike lane. So we expanded the creative pool to include fabricators, um, muralists, video producers, um, creative performers uh, to help the community tell their story. Um, this is Mixed Metaphors at a West Boulevard uh, production when it, it's, it's a Vision Zero event. So they were talking about uh, traffic safety. But having this resource available, not only to the community, but other city departments, if CDOT wants to paint their bike mural, they'll come to me and put together an RFP and we can put that to our uh, creative pool of over 60 individuals and it's expanding every year. And these people do get paid for what they do. Of course, yes. There is nothing goes to the creative pool without having a budget attached to it. That comes from either housing and neighborhood services, if a project has um, a cap and they need it, that, and it also comes out of uh, the placemaking grant as well. Um, to date, we have 50 creatives on our pool, um, and that's not limited to individuals. Uh, teams can apply, uh, 14 creative organizations. Um, in the past couple of years, we've given out 50 grants, over $600,000, and um, 28 of those have had works by local artists. And if you're in between cycles, our placemaking hub is our one-stop shop for public realm enhancements. So this is an online resource that is managed by the Urban Design Center, and these links go we review them and it's for community members to put public realm enhancements anytime you want. Like if you want to do a signal cabinet wrap, apply to the placemaking hub um, and then we can connect you to the services to, let's connect you to Duke, let's connect you to um, the energy uh, corporation to put your uh, little wild cabinet wrap on. It's, it's a one-stop shop that keeps the process moving throughout time. And some of our city quick wins um, are things that our staff works on in addition to the placemaking hub um, and the placemaking work. We have um, installations on our cycle track. We worked on street eateries. Our Black Lives mural um, was featured in Uptown. And 
it's the longevity of these projects also, especially with the Black Lives Matter mural. I put this on here as an example of lessons learned. Um, it was a time, it was during COVID and Tryon Street, our main artery of Uptown was shut down. We reopened it. This was a mistake. Um, instead of pedestrianizing this plaza and taking advantage of that situation of having no traffic, we let business go back to normal and our Black Lives mural faded. Um, we are working to remedy that with a new vision plan for Uptown. Um, hopefully we will see a pedestrianized Tryon Street in the near future. And with that comes a reclaiming of space that was previously neglected. Um, all our trees on Tryon Street, you can see, are coming to the end of their lives. So we're revitalizing that space from a city perspective as well. Um, we also do programming and shared streets events, really fun stuff on that as well. Let me turn cool. it over. Uh, has anyone heard of the term tactical urbanism before? Yeah, something? Okay, well just in case you haven't, um, it's, it's been this industry term uh, that's used to describe short uh, term, sort of quick win, uh, experimental type infrastructure, and so uh, I'm going to talk about my uh, experience with tactical urbanism here. So. I know Knoxville does Parking Day, and it makes me really excited. One of my favorite days of the year. But if you haven't heard of Parking Day, uh, it happens all around the world. Uh, basically, one day a year where people take over parallel parking spots and turn them into what we call parklets, which are these sort of um, versions of tactical urbanism that are used for advocacy and experimentation on our streets. So, uh, this group of people who participated in Parking Day uh, it was actually a neighborhood group uh, called The Nation's Neighborhood, if you're familiar, in Nashville. They would do Parking Day with us every year, and they wanted to do more of this stuff. So they invented this organization called TURBO, which stands for Tactical Urbanism Organizers, and they rallied around this idea of creating a, a road diet block party along the major corridor in their street. So what they did is they, uh, the, the term road diet basically suggests eliminating uh, width of road, I guess is probably the easiest way to describe it. So uh, they, they worked hard, actually, the, this was an unprecedented permit in our uh, government. They allowed traffic to move through a block party. That was like a huge, it, it doesn't sound like much, but it took a lot to, to get our government to approve that. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to demonstrate that it's not the end of the world to eliminate two travel lanes and use the street for something else. And so this was a photo from the block party uh, to, to show that activation of space. This was the street beforehand. It was a commercial corridor, like there's businesses along here. Um, and, and as this happened, literally a few days before the block party, an oil tanker exploded on the street. It caused, the, it was a hundreds of foot blast radius. Luckily, the driver survived and no one was killed, but it, it, there's a sort of industrial end of the street. And if it happened in this more of the business area, it would have been catastrophic. And so we, as this happened at the block party, we overlaid the blast radius over what the, there's a music venue called the Stone Fox. And we said, if this truck had crashed here, it would have engulfed the Stone Fox in flames. And luckily the council member was there at the time and was appalled by this and was <coughs> able to, I mean, it, it's not perfect, but it's an example of how tactical urbanism can make real change pretty quickly, uh, especially around incidents like disasters and things like that. So. Currently today, one travel lane in each direction, center turn lane and a two-way cycle track on, on one side. So not not still not perfect. I think ways to go of what we'd like to see. They added some stop signs. It's been improving slowly, but not quite, you know, we'll, we'll get there with more installations. And then we've seen uh, tactical urbanism in, in lots of places around our city. This is uh, the first, sadly, Nashville didn't have bike lanes downtown uh, until two years ago. And so this was a tactical urbanism project that led to Nashville's first downtown bike lane. Uh, we used it on more, our more probably most prominent uh, public space, Broadway, to uh, experiment with what we could do with expanded uh, sidewalks and, and different types of uses. And then ultimately went on to inform uh, what's there today. And then we've used it for transportation advocacy to uh, suggest new bus stops. This is a, a modular shelter we created that um, went on to actually um, a few different locations along, if you're Nolansville, it's one of our most used corridors for transit. And then we suggested new locations for, and, and consolidation for bus stops with these uh, installations. 
So I know we're, I know we're, we might be a little behind schedule, oh, so we might yes. just see this along. Gosh. And get, hopefully we'll have time for it. Yeah. Do we? When, yeah. when, is our, when is our? I'll end? let you know. Okay. <laughs> well, um, in that case. Yeah. <laughs> Kate, I love the I the your the way that you have set up the selection process and the um, like the the fast tracking of arts and that type of stuff. So, but I'm curious, like how your um, how the selection of location. Like it seems like you've got a good method with the the neighbors and things like that, but. Like you are a small, relatively small department. Like, how do you allocate resources in in high impact areas? Which I think you've done a good job of. Which is curious about. Absolutely. Um, so our, in addition to our placemaking program, we also have through the planning department a corridors of opportunity program. Um, this is a larger effort um, through Long Range, and it identifies corridors of need in in the city of Charlotte. Um, in the allocation process, we have bonus points towards art projects and the placemaking projects uh, that's codified in the selection process. Um, we make sure there's a geographic spread um, that things, like I said, don't end up in the wedge. Um, and it's also in the application process, we make it so, once again, that individuals can apply um, and that eliminates the, you need a neighborhood support, but that can come later and we help build that process. So making the grant low barrier to apply, offering help in the application process and giving the technical assistance to the grants that um, need a little help in materiality or that they don't um, fully recognize the potential of their problem project, we have the urban design um, hub in the urban design center to offer those resources. I guess I, I wonder about um, like neighborhoods that are maybe have more time and resources, mm -hmm. like how do you um, prioritize maybe more disenfranchised neighbor or is that part of the process? It's yeah. part of the process, yep, and it, it goes towards that point system yeah. um, and we um, <laughs> You can reapply to grants through a phased approach, but not always. <laughs> like it, 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 and if it, um, we we spread it out through um, with equity being, of course, at the front and working with our housing and neighborhood services to get the word out. So it's not just people who have access to social media who are looking at um, the process, but we have um, a robust marketing system to get this um, out. We do flyers, um, staff knows how expensive flyers are to put in the mail, but we take that extra step to make sure that everybody is reached and has the ability to apply. Like I've been on people's uh, doorsteps, uh, filling out a paper application to put in a, in a mural. Um, we make it, so we are approachable as staff, but we also make sure that people can approach the information. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Hey. <laughs> so with your tactical urbanism projects, um, how do you get funding? How do you pay for there your- There we go, yeah. So I should have mentioned that uh, this organization that started Turbo was completely volunteer led. It's just people that wanted to do this stuff. They all had day jobs and other things, so they sort of passed it to the Civic Design Center. We were involved in the formation, but not not leading it by any means, which is cool. I mean, it makes it like a real grassroots initiative. So how do we fund it? Uh, we get a grant from the city of Nashville, from our planning department, actually, to, to implement a lot of that work. We're partially funded. About a third of our funding comes from grants, a uh, third from private sector, and then um, Various government resources help us to fund the work that we do. And then we get to prioritize how we spend it when, once we fundraise and do all that stuff. Oh, so, awesome. um, yeah, it's been um, super great. We've, we've also had a foundation, Brown Family, contribute a lot to, which is a big philanthropy group in Nashville that, that is um, passionate about the built environment and, and wants to support that work. So, yeah. Cool. Let's see what else we got. So for a reclaiming public space discussion, um, in addition to smaller scale placemaking projects, our office also um, builds public spaces. 
Um, interesting fact about Charlotte is that our park and rec system and city of Charlotte split in the mid 2000s. So our park system is totally independent. It's a county entity from our city space. So the Urban Design Center uh, stepped into this space um, and has started to build and program and maintain and activate our public spaces. Um, Five Points Plaza represents the city's first public uh, space investment in over 30 years. It's in historic West End Charlotte, our HBU, Johnson C. Smith is across the street. Um, and you can see that it's uh, two separate sites actually. They're across the street um, is another seating area. We have a splash pad and it was super important to us as an office to maintain a high quality of design with this first uh, application. We're along the city's gold line um, and the mural of Lavanya mentioned is on the corner there. Um, this space was uh, recognized at the NC um, APA conference last week as a public art winner. Um, there's a collection of 10 pieces um, in this space from all the way up to <coughs> tile work to um, that larger column that's kind of obscured by the tree there. Um, but um, it was a concise effort to target local uh, artists, bring everybody into the space. And the city of Charlotte uh, has an activator um, to keep the space programmed with events, somebody from the community. Um, her name is Jessica, she's great. Uh, and it really speaks to the point of putting activations in our public spaces. Um, and this site was, the budget for this was a million dollars, um, but we have smaller scale opportunities here. Um, the Ritz was built with a Lowe's grant. Uh, this space is also <coughs> in Washington Heights. Um, it's a smaller scale site. Um, we put in a patio, a splash pad. This investment represents um, $175,000. Uh, we put it into pavers and um, uh, you can see the storage container in the back there for the community to store. Uh, equipment safely it's activated on a weekly basis um, and then we have a third space at the green at prosperity village uh, geographically this is in the northwest part the the ritz is center and uh Five Points is West. Um, this was built in 2020 with about $275,000 of capital improvement funds. Um, we do a shelter, there's a spray pad, and once again, the neighborhood um, leader name is Shika. Shika programs this space every time, but identifying those local champions um, goes so far. And we are gonna do three more spaces in the Greenville neighborhood uh, in addition to the Urban Arboretum Trail that we touched on before. Um, and this is just, once again, those smaller spaces for community um, to use. It's not about bringing people in for these nece spaces necessarily, it's about working with a community that is there. Um, and, these spaces can also be rented by the community through our public space permit project. Um, and it's free to rent any city space. Um, you just can't have any, well, actually you can have alcohol. You have to apply it to the county though, but please do not if you want to rent out my Greenville spaces, I swear to God. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a big collaboration with risk management. You know, the, these spaces, are an important piece of the Urban Design Center, but it's also a bigger piece of the community. Um, and we hope that both having those smaller community scale placemaking grants all the way up to these larger um, spaces, we can hopefully knit together these uh, communities that have been impacted so much. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it sort of leads us into this collaboration discussion. I mean, that's what, makes these projects so successful. So uh, I want to talk about, I mentioned Turbo. Uh, the, another initiative our, of our organization is called the Nashville Youth Design Team. And this is a part of our youth programming. Uh, people who have gone through, we have a, a educational curriculum for seventh and eighth grade. In seventh grade, they discuss uh, transportation issues and advocacy. And then in eighth grade, they do affordable housing and actually like build scale models and all, all kind of 
great uh, three-week crash course in sort of civics and um, those two topics. And then those students, and it's in about a third of schools in Davidson County, we just expanded to, to um, Chattanooga, and we want to do some stuff here too, so um, it'd be great. But the, the students who go through that process then become eligible for our high school internship, which is called the National Youth Design Team. Uh, where the outcome is to do tactical urbanism based on some research and uh, things that they want to do. Basically the same work we do, the youth design team does and, and leads and self-guides that work. Um, and so I want to talk about the importance of collaboration and, and that project in particular. Um, Dickerson Pike in Nashville is one of Tennessee's most deadly streets for pedestrians, uh, at least in recent years. And so the youth design team looked at some data from another uh, walking and biking advocacy um, group in Nashville, Walk Bike Nashville, and uh, saw these numbers and said, we need to do something. And this is the condition currently of Dickerson Pike, and, and probably similar to a lot of streets uh, in Knoxville, sadly. Um, you know, like we, we see the staircase that just goes into basically a three, four, five lane uh, road and, you know, lack of sidewalks. This is what, the, the kind of scary thing about, I mean, lots of scary things about this, but this is one of Nashville's highest used bus corridors. So how do people get to the bus in these situations, you know? And so like lots of issues, uh, it's, it's right along those East Bank areas that I showed earlier. This road is, is parallel to the, that 300 acre development. So like we don't have infrastructure that's gonna support that type of development and we need to address it. So that the youth design team saw that and uh, they focus, this is an intersection of Hart Lane and Dickerson. It, it was the deadliest intersection in the state um, in 2020. And so they, you know, pinpointed this and, and went there to address it. They uh, designed these artistic bulb outs, uh, you know, very temporary in nature, but shortened crossing distance, tightened up turn radius, slow traffic uh, with, with those measures. And then um, this is them out there. They went out there and painted it. We had. Uh, blessings from TDOT, and that, that's part of the successes, I think, of this project, is we were able, the, the students, we set up a meeting with the region managers, and uh, the, the students presented these problems and issues and, and the ways they wanted to solve it to TDOT. It wasn't, it wasn't the design center. We, we set up the conversation, but we didn't, we didn't make the presentation. And I think there's a lot of power in that, and, and youth has, um, you know, historically underrepresented in planning, but if given the chance, they can be, be a catalyst for change. So um, that's sort of the idea behind the youth design team. Uh, it went on, so after all this, the installation took place, it, it went up and down, uh, but we, we were able to show the need and success, like slowing traffic. Uh, more, we actually found more people were using it. There was like these temporary lighting displays and maybe it was just to go see it, kind of an artistic piece, but it was there for a weekend nights and we sort of made an event around it, but it, it got the news there. It got people involved, it got neighbors there just to come see it, and so sort of elevated the issue that way. Uh, a few days after that, TDOT announced a $30 million investment in our exact focus area of this street um, to do complete street overhaul of, of that, of exactly what we were asking for. So I say that to say, I mean, there were many partners involved in this process, uh, and it, it, it even this is this is sort of the next step. Uh, Smart Growth America chose Tennessee as one of their Complete Streets Academy um, states they wanted to work in, and so the Nashville representatives uh, chose Dickerson again to sort of continue on the momentum of that work. And then it really took all these partners that you see listed here to create and, and continue this work to, to advance the concept. So then. We went on to do more tactical urbanism. This was probably the most active zone in Dickerson. There's a, a staffing zone, Piggly Wiggly, a, a grocery store, Sonic, all kinds of things that get people that are actually walking on this street with no sidewalks. Um, and so we built this pedestrian refuge island. We worked with artist Charles Key, who's a, a Nashville, uh, kind, of a, kind of an icon. I, I think he's an icon, uh, but he, he did this sort of Cumberland River piano key uh, installation and we installed this pedestrian refuge island here. Uh, and this just went up a few days ago. So um, it's just, you know, it's, it's minor, but it gives us an opportunity to have conversations with neighbors and business owners about how it could work with sidewalks here and more substantial infrastructure. So um, yeah, I mean, I think along these lines, um, these are sort of, you know, very micro, fine-grained uh, discussions around um, like how you all can 
can make change in your community. So, um, I forgot my question. <laughs> I think this collaboration has been great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I remember. Yes. Um, so, with your installations, especially the ones you're showing, like we know, we sort of know what it takes to build these types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Program. I think you were sort of joking about the alcohol conversation, but alcohol is a great way to activate spaces mm -hmm. and sort of program. I, like we say it and jest, but like it, it does, you know, brings people out. It gets people to a place that they might no not normally be at, at a certain time of day. Um, so I asked kind of a two part thing. Yeah. Like what types of, I mean, you mentioned a lot of programming aspects of these ins place making installations, but what about maintenance too for, for these things? Because that's been. With Turbo, we, mm -hmm. that's sort of why what makes them very quick is like we can only afford to have these for really marginal amounts of time. So like, how do you these your installations are much more like lasting, and I think the maintenance is key on those. Yeah, it is. This is where being part of the city really comes in handy because we have general services on uh, call. So it's nice to have our solid waste partners to be involved in this process. We have um, our his name is Alex, Alex from General Services. It's one call away. Um, but it's once again connecting with the people on the ground who are using the space on a daily basis, going to our programming staff um, and having um, that direct line to know when to go out. It's if we leave garbage out on the sidewalk of our public space, but we don't know about it, it's not forgetting about these public spaces are here and having that uh, community input to be able to call us to go out and service it. And that has been a learning curve as well um, because we have run into that issue um, when we're six people, um, but we have an entire community to rely on. And it's building these spaces in collaboration with our community partners and having that built relationship with our neighborhood organizations, with the people who are out here, our artists, our creatives who are using these spaces daily to be able to call us and be like, hey, Kate, come take out the trash. I'm like, I'd be glad to, just let me know. Nice. All right. Cool. Did you have anything more? Or is this just one of those you could keep going and we going? Can go, we can yeah. go. Yeah. I think we got a talk show. Um, so what I'd like to do, we're gonna get ready uh, to do lunch here real quickly, but um, should we do at least one question? Can we take one? I mean, I know there's gonna be a lot, so. Uh, there's a question back there. Mr. Whitmore, please stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there was a question earlier about mobility and something that's facing, uh, Knoxville's facing right now is that we're uh, having a lot more days in the summer where we're having 95, 90 degree days that are really threatening mobility and walkability in the city. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about initiatives or design opportunities that start to address that issue in your city, especially, you know, it's not just threatening uh, people who live here, but people who come to visit and walk the city. So I'm just wondering if there's things you've done. Um, I know you talked about the tree canopy, the conservation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, streetscaping like when you get opportunities that you know, like there's an investment coming from either the state or the city or something, if you think about streetscaping as addressing those types of things, like that's opportunities for more trees, right? Like that provides more shade. So I'd say like if, if you can align, and that's a lot of the work that we do, I don't know about your organization, but it's kind of just like make like, if there's a Metro water project or if there's like some sort of thing, like a big uh, disruption in, in or a new building coming along, can we incorporate community benefit, uh, especially if we know that those are key issues like near transit or something like that, could be a good way to prioritize certain things. Yeah, and we work closely with our urban forestry division and we're in the midst of doing a tree canopy preservation master plan and updating that and it's uh, preserving uh, tree health because we have aging trees in Charlotte. Um, our tree canopy is disappearing by 35%. Um, and it's not just about planting new trees, but monitoring the health of existing trees um, through our land banking um, system for our, in our uh, unified development ordinance and our tree save. 
We also have a program through our tree canopy preservation where they're able to buy parcels and protect trees um, with that funding. And it's longevity of the tree, planting the tree and having that uh, having the regulatory teeth to protect your trees and plant with it too. And we also put splash pads in all of our, uh, uh public spaces. Yes. Big maintenance. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> all right. We are going to shut the questions down right there because lunch is next. Um, but it wouldn't be a sustainability.